This video is sponsored by NOAA, an audio app I use for listening to articles from the world's leading financial publications. Check them out using the link in the description below. David Geffen provoked outrage in March 2020 when he posted on Instagram that he was isolating on his super yacht in the Grenadines, avoiding the virus, at a time when most people were worrying about their and their loved ones' health and the crashing economy, it seemed a bit tone-deaf and boastful to post that you were living in extreme luxury far away from other people's troubles. Two weeks ago, it hit the headlines that a yacht builder in the Netherlands is making a 127-meter boat for Jeff Bezos, which is so tall it may require part of a bridge in Rotterdam to be dismantled and later rebuilt as it makes its way to the sea. When it was announced that the city might agree to this work, allowing the boat access to open waters at Bezos' expense, a Facebook group formed to organize a protest at the bridge and throw eggs at the yacht as it goes by. Now look, I understand after the ever given situation last year, people are a bit sensitive about big boats getting stuck in rivers. In truth though, I'm much more offended by the tight pants that Jeff has been wearing since his divorce and the fact that he doesn't appear to eat human food anymore. So what are we to make of billionaires and their yachts and their rockets? Should we be happy to see them enjoying the fruits of their labor? Or should we be upset that their lives are so much better than that of the average person? Well, the charity Oxfam announced last month that the world's 10 richest people more than doubled their wealth during the two years of a pandemic that saw many people's incomes fall. And in times like this, super yachts can be quite polarizing. There are calls from politicians and activists all around the world that the wealthy should be heavily taxed. But is this a reasonable solution to a real problem, or is it just driven by jealousy? Would such an approach create more unintended problems than it would solve? With an end to the pandemic finally in sight, policymakers' minds are turning to replenishing COVID-depleted government coffers. And this will be no small undertaking. Government borrowing as a percentage of GDP hit its highest level since World War II. Left-leaning politicians propose that the best approach to dealing with this is to raise taxes on the wealthy, which will pay for fiscal spending and reduce income inequality. They argued that the people who have benefited the most in recent years should bear the burden of the cost of programs that help the rest of the population. In light of the widening gap between economic winners and losers, they say that they should use the tax code to reduce inequality more aggressively than today's tax code does. They argue that the average tax rate paid by people at the top has fallen over time. Opponents say that the rich already pay more than their fair share of taxes and warn that hiking taxes will have unwelcome side effects on the economy, such as less investment and slower economic growth. Now, while it might offend some to see the ultra wealthy spending so much money on toys that are unaffordable to most of us like super yachts, it's worth noting that it's much better for the wealthy to be spending their money rather than saving it all and living a frugal lifestyle. When the rich spend, their money is distributed through the economy. Skilled craftsmen are employed in building and maintaining yachts, and others are employed in staffing them. These workers then go on to spend their earnings, and the money works its way through the economy and multiplies. Spending by one individual becomes part of the earnings of another. If billionaires were frugal, it would worsen the economic situation of another individual who in turn would cut their spending. Some would argue that this spending is simply unnecessary. We don't need the rich to buy super yachts if the super wealthy were subjected to a wealth tax. Elizabeth Warren suggests 2% of their wealth every year. That would transfer their wealth into the hands of the 99% even more efficiently. This, however, is an economic fallacy. It's tied to the idea that in every transaction, one person's gain is another person's loss. But let's say you paid 99 cents to download a track from your favorite musician on iTunes. You'll hopefully get more than 99 cents of enjoyment out of that track, and thus you're most likely happy with the transaction, even if your favorite musician does become much wealthier than you are by selling the same track over and over again to different people. 
in a free economy, an individual can only earn money when someone else willingly pays it to them for a service or a product that no one is required to buy. These transactions are mutually beneficial. They work for both the buyer and seller. When a good that's in demand is created and sold, this grows the economy. On the other hand, when money is taken from one person as a tax and given to another, we'll say as a government grant, that really is a zero-sum game, where one person's gain is another person's loss. No goods of value were created and circulate in the economy. Sometimes when listening to pundits arguing for taxing the rich, you get the impression that their wealth is a bottomless well that can be constantly tapped by governments to meet their spending needs. That's not really the case, though. The Institute for Policy Studies estimates that there are 745 billionaires in the United States whose combined net worth comes to just over $5 trillion. The US government spends around $7 trillion in a year, or around $19 billion per day. While no one is suggesting this, Confiscating the billionaire's entire wealth in a one-off tax would not even pay for nine months of US government spending. While this might save a bridge in Rotterdam from the indignity of disassembly, it would have a devastating effect on the economy. Now, before I go any further, let me quickly tell you about today's video sponsor, NOAA or News Over Audio. NOAA is an audio app that allows you to listen to thought-provoking journalism from the world of finance when you don't have time to read. NOAA is amazing for when you're exercising at the gym, commuting, or doing household chores. There are articles available from The Economist, Bloomberg, Harvard Business Review, and many more. It's high-quality audio content read by a team of celebrated narrators. Because the content is sourced from a number of high-quality publications, you don't find yourself stuck in an echo chamber. It's one app, but multiple perspectives. NOAA focuses on high-value, in-depth analysis and opinion, not on breaking news. A dedicated team of expert editors handpick the best articles and craft topic-specific series to help you understand the story behind the news. Their recent series on the billionaire space race inspired this video. Get a 7-day free trial plus 37% off annual membership by signing up using the link in the description below or using the offer code Patrick Boyle. Okay, so back to our content. The Wealth Tax Commission in the UK conducted a feasibility study on applying a wealth tax and suggested that a wealth tax of less than 0.1% would make the tax too administratively costly to be worthwhile, and a tax of 5% or greater would lead to liquidity challenges, requiring taxpayers to sell their assets in order to fund the tax. They suggested that if a wealth tax were to be applied, a one-off tax would be the best approach, as it would eliminate distortive behaviours, the tax policy term for actions that taxpayers would most likely take in order to reduce their tax burden, such as moving abroad. It's worth noting that many billionaires are not wealthy because they've earned high incomes and have a lot of cash lying around. Instead, they've built up businesses that are very valuable, but they have not sold those businesses. So most of their wealth is not readily available to them for spending purposes. Applying a wealth tax to family-owned businesses would have a significant impact on a vital sector of the economy. Family business owners typically don't have substantial personal wealth outside of their business in cash, and therefore any wealth tax would need to be funded from the business, which would affect how the business uses its capital for investment and future growth. Including main homes and pensions in such a tax could also be difficult from a liquidity perspective, as well as potentially undermining public support for such a tax. In truth, it would be very unusual for governments to start forcing entrepreneurs to sell their businesses, and if those businesses were privately held, for the government to slowly nationalize them as a form of taxation. When talking about taxing the rich, we have to consider the incentive structures that such taxes might put in place. 
If the government were to cap an individual's wealth, entrepreneurs like Elon Musk, who made $100 million from the sale of PayPal back in 2002, would have most likely stopped working at this point. He would never have started Tesla, SpaceX, or that small underground taxi company that he owns in Las Vegas. The businesses he has founded combined to provide jobs for over 110,000 people worldwide. Whether you like Elon Musk or not, he does build products that people seem to want to buy, and he employs a lot of people. So if a wealth tax really wouldn't raise enough money to pay for government spending and would be harmful to the economy, are there fairer approaches that might tackle inequality? Well, one question we have to ask when looking at people who've amassed great fortunes is if they've benefited unreasonably from government largesse. As I said earlier, when money is taken from one person as a tax and given to another, it's a zero-sum game, quite different to the mutually beneficial transactions that occur in a free economy. So when an individual uses political influence to get benefits at the expense of the general public, that is also a zero-sum game. Back in 2017, Jeff Bezos got a lot of bad press when Amazon announced a request for proposals to North American cities to host a second corporate headquarters for the firm. The company asked cities to highlight the education and skills of their workforce, the quality of their transit and built environment, the strength of their schools and universities, and the livability of their communities. So far, that seems fine. But Amazon also requested that each jurisdiction describe what level of tax incentives they would provide so that the company could understand how tax breaks would help defray the initial cost of the proposed $5 billion investment. Economists, city council members, socialists, and even the Koch brothers were united in their outrage as state and city leaders offered large economic incentives to the corporate giant. Amazon is not the only billionaire-owned company to have requested government handouts. According to the LA Times, Elon Musk's companies Tesla, SpaceX, and SolarCity received almost $5 billion in government support by 2015, and they've received even more since. A good argument could be made that governments should not be spending taxpayer money or putting their thumbs on the scale to support these large businesses. Not only does government largesse line the pockets of billionaires, but it also props up huge firms like Amazon and Tesla at the expense of small businesses. The big get bigger and the small but innovative startups struggle to compete when the playing field is not level. Of course, governments around the world do appear to want to support and encourage certain businesses, and you may even agree with this. Green energy, electric vehicles, and high technology being obvious examples. Subsidies to renewable energy research has been credited with increasing innovation, lowering costs, and expanding the energy mix. Some would argue that subsidizing the right kinds of business is necessary both for the greater good and to compete with other countries who are busy subsidizing their national champions with the goal of growing their economies. But you probably shouldn't subsidize favored industries if you're then going to complain that these subsidies make people rich. Some would argue that if other countries are supporting their big businesses, choosing not to means that your country can't compete. Well, we can look at the example of Singapore, a country with some of the lowest taxes in the world, which has a small domestic market and few natural resources, but is a leader in electronics manufacturing, machinery, financial services, tourism, and shipping. Being a low-tax country, Singapore doesn't have much money to subsidize its industries or bail out failing firms, but it seems to be able to compete as maybe keeping taxes low is good enough. Next up, we have to ask if it makes sense for governments to designate certain firms as too big to fail and then bail them out when things go wrong. Ask three people their opinion on the bailouts during the 2008 financial crisis, and you're likely to get three different answers. Policymakers from that time argue that bailing out critical financial institutions was necessary to stave off an even greater meltdown. Others maintain that the government should have taken even more aggressive actions, saving Lehman Brothers, for instance, or rescuing homeowners with underwater mortgages. 
Still others say that the government shouldn't have used taxpayers' money at all to save wealthy bankers. Each of those groups can find numbers to support their conflicting views of the bailout's price tag. The US president claimed to have gotten back every penny that was spent on the bailouts, and some claim that governments even profited from the bailouts. There's no right answer as different groups have different opinions on the role of government in the economy. But it's worth thinking through the different ways that governments around the world intervene in markets. Politicians can only act so surprised by inequality when many of their decisions, which are usually well-meaning, contribute significantly to the redistribution of wealth in an economy. Other questions we could ask is if some of the tech billionaires benefit from monopoly power. Amazon, for example, controls over 60% of all book distribution. Companies like Uber have been in business since 2009, and you could argue that the fact that they lose billions of dollars per year means that fares are being sold below cost to push out competition. Antitrust laws exist to deal with monopolies and to ensure that there's a reasonable level of competition in an economy, which benefits consumers, workers, and small businesses. Yet antitrust laws have been relatively ineffective for free services like Facebook and Google, leading to near-monopoly conditions in these industries. This has gone largely unnoticed by anti-competition authorities, as they're used to dealing with more traditional monopolies. Next up, we need to discuss the philanthropy of many of the modern billionaires. Some would argue that philanthropy from the rich can replace some of the work of taxation. For example, the Gates Foundation has given away more than $50 billion since its inception. Additionally, this philanthropy is often international in its scope, like the Gates Foundation's efforts to eradicate polio globally and develop green energy technology solutions. Others would argue that while these charities do good work, philanthropy as a substitute for government spending brings problems of its own. One is that billionaires often choose causes that you might not agree with. Odds are that if you admire George Soros' philanthropic work, you'll hate the work done by the Koch Foundation, and vice versa. More generally, philanthropy tends to benefit charismatic causes such as the arts, university endowments, and the environment over less exciting ones that may be more important. Another cause for concern is that allowing philanthropy to take over from taxation is another way of transferring power from the state to the wealthy, when people are already questioning how much influence billionaires should have. The German comedian Henning Wein summed this up a few years ago when he said, we don't do charity in Germany, we pay taxes. However you want to look at it, it would appear that the modern American billionaire is more willing to give away their wealth than people were in the past. Michelle Gelfand, a professor of psychology at the University of Maryland, has done some interesting research on how different cultures have different norms, and that you can't take a structure that works in Sweden and transplant it to the United States, or an idea that works in Singapore and transplant it to France. In different cultures, people have very different opinions on the role of government, how high the tax burden should be, and they have very different opinions on the super wealthy. In the United States, people tend to be more positive about the 1% than they are in other parts of the world. This is partially because they don't want the door slammed shut before they have their chance of making their way to the top. The top 1% in terms of annual earnings is often considered a static group, but people actually rise up into it and fall out of it quite frequently. That's because their incomes can vary widely year to year. 11% of Americans will be in the top 1% for at least one year during their prime working lives, and just under 6% will be in it for two years or more. On the flip side, it's not uncommon for Americans to spend some time at the bottom of the heap. Over half of Americans will be in or near poverty for at least one year of their life by their 60th birthdays. One of the better criticisms of a high-tax society comes from Milton Friedman, who points out that when an individual spends their own money on themselves, they're usually very careful about what they spend it on, and they make sure that they get the most they can for their money. They're less efficient when they spend their money on someone else or spend someone else's money on themselves. 
But the worst outcome is when you spend somebody else's money on somebody else. You're less careful about choosing a suitable good and about getting good value for money. This is the situation you end up with when you rely on government redistribution. Friedman argues that in an environment where we are accustomed to spending other people's money on someone else, we end up not maximizing the value of the dollar. We also don't end up appreciating money as much either. It's easy to pick up a newspaper and get upset that Jeff Bezos has a big boat and gets to eat lizards for dinner every night if he wants to. But the distribution of wealth in society is not just about marginal tax rates. If we are to discuss a complex topic like wealth inequality, we need to look at the big picture and acknowledge that there are pros and cons to the various ways we can choose to organize our societies. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch this one next. Don't forget to click on the link in the description below to get a 7-day free trial and 37% off annual membership to NOAA. Have a great day and talk to you soon. Bye.